We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us to go into your word this morning. We thank you, O oh God, for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for Jesus coming back to life three days later, Father. Father, we pray right now that you bless this time, O oh God. Open up our hearts and open up our minds. Help us to hear what your word is saying. We bless you right now. Speak to me and through me, O oh God. Let your people not hear me, but you who live within me. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 You may sit. So we are starting a new sermon series today, which is entitled, I Am Jesus. And part number one is going to talk about how Jesus says that he is the shepherd and the door. And this Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to look at the different descriptions that Jesus gives about himself. Because there's so much misconception in the world concerning who Jesus is. So when you want to find out about someone, the best person to go to is that person themselves so you can find out who they say they really are. And for us, in order for us to do that, we have to go into the scriptures. We have to look at Jesus and see what he says so he can tell us who he really is. He tells us in our text this morning that he is the shepherd and the door. But in order for us to get a fuller picture of, of what's going on in chapter 10, you've got to go back to chapter number 9. Because in chapter number 9, that is where Jesus heals this blind man who was born blind. The Bible tells us that when Jesus went to him and saw him, he had his disciples with him. And when Jesus and his disciples saw the man who was born blind, his disciples asked Jesus, who is it or why is this man born blind? Was it his sin? Was it his fault? Or was it his parents' fault? Who was the issue or what was the issue that caused this man to have trouble ever since he has been born? The Bible says that Jesus says in John 9, 3, that it was neither of their faults. It wasn't the son's fault. It wasn't, his, it wasn't the parents' fault. Jesus says that he was born blind so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. You know, some folks wonder why they've been having problems all their life. Why, why did they go through this and, and, and they didn't do anything to cause that problem? Can I tell you that maybe that problem is there so God can show up in your life? Maybe that problem is there so you can see that there's a void in your life and you need to look for something outside of yourself to find Jesus. That that, that, that problem, that hindrance is there so God can show up and show out in your life. To where that problem is there, not so you can see how bad life is, but so that you can see how good Jesus is. That, 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 that thought that you think, that, that, that thing that you're dealing with is not really a, 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 a real limitation. It's not really a real hindrance, but that limitation, that hindrance is actually a vehicle for the power of God. It's a vehicle so that God can show his glory in your life. And I just want to encourage you that you open up your heart, that you open up your mind to Jesus. The Bible says how Jesus, he went onto the ground, he spit on the ground, and he, he took some, some dirt and he put it together and he made some clay. And the Bible says how he then took the clay and he wiped it on the man's eyes. The Bible says that Jesus told him, okay, now I need you to go over to the pool of Siloam and I need you to wash in the pool. And the Bible says when he came, when he got done washing, he came back and he began to see. And people begin to ask him, man, how did you, how did you begin to see? I, I know you were blind. Matter of fact, I saw you begging, and I know you've been blind all your life. How did this happen? And he began to rehearse to them the story, telling them how Jesus came and how Jesus spit on the ground, how Jesus made the clay, and how he wiped it on his eyes and said, go to the pool and wash. The Bible says that they told, they took the beggar, who was blind, but now he sees. They took him to the, 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 the religious rulers of that day. Took him to the Pharisees. He took him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees began to question him and begin to ask him, how have you now have your sight? And he began to rehearse to them the same exact story. And the Bible says they got offended. 
Because Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. See, that's the problem with some religious folks. Whenever God does something different, they think, oh, that can't be God because he didn't do it the way I have experienced it all my life. You know God is smarter than you. <laughs> He's smarter than me. So just because we've never seen God do that don't mean that God can't do that. And they be trying, and they, be, and they got offended, and they begin to discredit the man. They said, you know what, you, maybe, maybe you were never blind in the first place. So the Bible says that they called his parents. They said, look, go, 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 go get his mama, go get his daddy. And they begin to question the parents. It's, they say, is this your son? Has he always been blind? The Bible says, yeah, well, they say, yeah, that's, that's our kid. And he's been, and he's been blind all his life. The Bible says at the end of the story, chapter 9, it says how they put the man out of the synagogue. They kicked the man out of church. They kicked the man out of the synagogue. All because he believed that Jesus was sent by God. Do you know you believe Jesus for real? Some folks don't want nothing to do with you. When, when you believe who Jesus is for real, not this fake stuff. Now, I'm glad you're in church, but not just coming to church stuff. But when you believe Jesus for real, some folks ain't going to want nothing to do with you. Not your family members, not some of your friends, not even some church folks. Oh, he just got too holy now. Oh, 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 I remember you used to drink all the liquor and didn't leave any for nobody. And now you want to go to Sunday school and Wednesday night Bible study and you tote your Bible everywhere, your Bible thump them, right? They get all crazy. Because your, because your life begins to change. And the Bible says Jesus found the man after he got kicked out of the synagogue. Jesus finds the man after he is excommunicated and tells the beggar, tells the man who was blind now sees. He says, he is, that Jesus is God. He says, he says, do you believe in the Son of God? And the blind man says, Lord, if you show me who he is, I will believe. And he says, I am he who you talk to. I'm the Son of God. Now understand, when Jesus says he is the Son of God, he is saying that he is God. Because you cannot be the Son of God unless you are God. He says, I am God. And he says that Jesus says to him that he, Jesus says, listen, now I've came so that blind people can see. And people who think they can see, yeah, I'm going to make them blind. Now understand, in the, in, in, the, in the story, in chapter 10, Jesus literally changed the man's sight to where he was blind and now he sees. But he's also talking about spiritually so that people who, who, who think they know who Jesus is, like Muslims think they know who Jesus is. Atheists think they know who Jesus is. Jehovah's Witness think they know who Jesus is. And for those people who think they know who Jesus is, Jesus says, yeah, they're blind. But those folks who, who are seeking after me for real, who look at me in the scriptures and read their Bible and find out who I am, yeah, even though they were blind, I'm going to make them see me for real. So even though they were born blind, they'll be able to see and while Jesus was saying this, there were some Pharisees around. While Jesus was telling this man how he is God and he's to make some folks who, who, who think they see about to make them blind, they began to ask Jesus, who, who are you talking about, Jesus? Are you, are you saying we are blind? The religious leaders, the Pharisees, are we blind? Jesus let them know, yeah, because you think you know who I am. So yes, you will be blind. And that's the context of, of John chapter 10. To where Jesus told this man how he is God and how he is making people who has no sight to be able to see him and people who think they know him, he make them blind. And, and that also now this, this, this healed man is here and people are upset. The Pharisees, they're upset. So Jesus says in chapter 10 verses 1 through 5, he enters into a story. A, a, the Bible calls this a parable. He enters into a parable and he begins to talk about how he is the good shepherd. He begins to talk about some sheep in this story. He begins to talk about some thieves and some robbers who he also called strangers. 
He says, Jesus says, when, when the shepherd went into the flock to, to grab the sheep out of the sheepfold. Now understand, the sheepfold was basically like a garage in the city, all right? So the sheepfold would be a, a, a walled area that's made out of rocks. And the people would take, or the shepherds would take their sheep in, and they would leave them there for the night. Jesus says, when the shepherd comes into the sheepfold to get out the sheep, he says he's only able to go through the door. But those thieves and robbers, because they're not the shepherd, they got to jump over the wall. They, they have to go a different way because they're not going through the right way. And once the thieves get in, now listen now, in the parable, it says when the thieves get in and they, and they steal the sheep, the sheep won't follow them because the sheep don't know their voice. But when the shepherd shows up, all the shepherd has to do is talk. And when he talks, the sheep begin to listen and follow. I wonder, are you listening to the shepherd's voice? If you are a follower of Jesus, you should know his voice. So when he talks, you hear him and you know that it is him calling. But here's the thing, in order for the sheep to, in, to understand the shepherd's voice, they had to spend time with the shepherd. If you don't spend time with the shepherd, you will never know his voice. That's how children know their parents' voice, because you spend time with your children. I remember growing up, we have a bunch of people outside, and when the lights go on, next thing you know, I heard my mama calling. She down the street, but I knew that was my mama. Then I, I see y'all later. Peace out, y'all. You know what I mean? No need, no problem with mama. Right, she come down there with that switch and she wasn't just, man, she'll lay into you too. You know what I'm saying? She, and, she, and, and no embarrassment. You know what I mean? She just beat you in front of everybody. Like, lady, have a conscience? Have a conscience? She ain't care. She wanted me home, right? And the Bible says, right, after, after all of this, right, after he told the story in, in, in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, how... The people began to say, what is he talking about? They did, they, they did not understand Jesus' story. So Jesus begins to talk very plainly to them in verses 7 through 18, which is our text. He begins to talk very plainly to them. Now understand, now we are looking backwards, right? So it may be, it may be confusing to us, but during that time where the people were there listening to Jesus, they understood exactly what he was saying. Jesus said, listen now, I am the door. He said, listen, I am the shepherd. And he says those titles twice to reiterate to them who he is. He says in verse 9 and 7, he says, listen, I'm the door. He says in verses 11 and 14, I'm the good shepherd. And I want us to take a couple minutes to just look at those, those two titles, all right? The first title is the good shepherd. How Jesus says he is the good shepherd and he is able to get the sheep out of the sheepfold. But he is the good shepherd because he has gone through the door of Old Testament prophecy. Everything that the Old Testament said about Jesus, how the Messiah will come and what the Messiah would do, Jesus did. So he is able to go and grab the sheep. Everything he did fulfilling prophecy was to show that he was and is the Messiah. And what is the sheep he's talking about in the story, verses 1 through 5? The sheep he's talking about is the nation of Israel. He says, I'm going to go and get these, the nation of Israel and pull them to myself. Remember Psalm 103? It says how Israel is the sheep of God. And while Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't go to any Gentiles. He went to the lost sheep of Israel, trying to pull them back to God and pull them to himself. And I love the people who were drawn to him. Yeah, it was some educated folks who were, right? There were some, some, some scribes and some Pharisees and some Sadducees, some, some upper echelon folks who were, who were drawn to him. But most of the multitude were people who were blind. People who, who were lame. People who, 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 had, who were hawked, who had, who had arms missing and legs missing. People who were, who were tapped collectors. They, was, they were basically, you know, uh, loan sharks. People who were zealots, extremists. 
The Bible says how notorious sinners follow Jesus. Notorious. I mean, like people you don't even want to be around. You know what I mean? Notorious sinners follow Jesus. Poor people follow Jesus. Paralyzed people follow Jesus. People who knew they had problems follow Jesus. I would rather be around some folks who know they got problems and know they need Jesus than be around a bunch of folks who are delusional about who they are. And how they think they are self-righteous and they got it all together. Listen here, your pastor ain't got it all together. Ask Sister Lisa where she at. There she go. She'll tell you. Man, you better pray for your pastor. Right? So, all these people with issues, these outcasts, these, these marginalized people followed after Jesus. The Bible says how Jesus was there and he was, he was, he was calling them out bringing them out of bondage, bondage to the law and bondage to man-made traditions, bondage to, to man-made customs, bringing them back to God. He was leading them out because they began to recognize his voice. He begins to teach and they begin to say, oh yeah, that's God. And they begin to stop listening to those Pharisees. Pharisees start getting mad. Like, y'all leaving church? No, 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 to listen to him? No, no. They begin to get upset. Not only did Jesus call those Pharisees thieves and robbers, the scripture that we read said he called them hirelings, hired hands, to where they didn't love Israel like Jesus loved Israel. They loved Israel with money. They didn't love Israel and they didn't lead Israel. They mercilessly, mercilessly drove Israel. They didn't feed the people, they fed themselves. And they didn't help them when trouble came, when the wolves came. They fled. Can I encourage you? You need to be a part of a church that looks to feed people and not just themselves. That, that you be a part of a church that where it, that not only are we trying to lead people inside the congregation, we're trying to reach people in the world and lead them also to Jesus. To where we don't leave people alone just because they fall into trouble. And while Israel, right, is a sheepfold in verses 1 through 5, Jesus also says in verse 16, he says, I have some sheep that is not a part of this fold. I have some sheep who are not a part of Israel. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and you are not a Jew, he is talking about you. That there are some non-Jewish Christians that he has called to himself. And Jesus calls him or calls you and I when we heard the gospel message. When we heard how much he loved us. When we heard how much he sacrificed for us. When we heard he died for us, shed his blood for us, and he came back to life three days later for us. When we heard that message, repented of our sins, made Jesus our Lord, we became a part of his glorious church. Hallelujah. Bringing us out of bondage. You and I bringing us out of, of idolatry. Where we are worshiping stuff we shouldn't have been worshiping. Bringing us out of false religions. Bringing us out of self-centered living. And bringing us out of meaningless customs and traditions. And for those who are not followers of Christ... For us here who, are, who, are, who, are, who don't believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection yet, I encourage you to believe. I encourage you to, to give your life to him. That's why you're here this morning, because he is drawing you to himself. He's not drawing you to Pastor Steve. He's not drawing you to Mount Calvary. He is drawing you to himself. Because you, 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 I, I, I know that you probably tried other stuff. You tried money, you tried sex, you tried women, you tried men, you tried multiples of them together probably. Don't look at me like that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You may say it all your life, right? That, that, that you tried all that stuff, but you keep coming back to church. You keep coming back to Jesus. Why? Not because anyone is inviting you. Those are just vehicles for Jesus to draw you to himself. 
And I encourage you, don't fight it. Don't, don't fight giving your life to Christ. Give your life to Jesus right now. Jesus wants you to be a part of his church. He wants you to be a part of his flock. He wants you to be a part of his family. The Bible says Jesus is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd takes care of his own. He cares for the sheep. How does he care? Because not only is he, as I said, the good shepherd, not only does he uh, also bring us out of, out of darkness and bondage and lifestyles that are ungodly, he also leads us once we give our life to him. To where, when you look at that time in the scriptures, right? So when the shepherd would take the, the sheep out of the sheepfold in the city, he would take them off to other places. They began to graze and they would go and do other things. And when it got dark and they didn't reach back to the city in time, the Bible said, the, the, the custom of that time would be that the shepherd would create a sheepfold out wherever they were. He would build the rocks or put the rocks together and build the sheepfold, the walls, and he would lay at the door to where just in case any wolves come, they couldn't get in. Just in case any thieves come or any robbers come, they couldn't get in. Jesus said, if you, if you want to have a relationship with him, you got to enter through the door. And he is the door. He is the door. If you want a relationship with God, you cannot get it through Muhammad. If you want a relationship with God, you cannot get it through the Jehovah's Witness. If you want a relationship with God, you cannot get it through, I don't know, some mystical somebody somewhere. What's that man named? Deep Proper Chopra, whatever his name is. You can't get it through him either. Or Wayne Dyer, right? Any, any of those people, you can't get a relationship with God through that people because they are not the door. The door is Jesus. Verse 9 says, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pastures. He says, listen, if you want salvation, you got to come through me. If you want to have a relationship with God, you got to go through Jesus. And that salvation is literally deliverance from sin, hellfire, and brimstone. If you want to escape the wrath of God, you need Jesus. Salvation is only found in him. Listen to what the apostle Peter says. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the door that allows you to escape punishment. Jesus is the door that allows you to escape an eternity of damnation of fire. Jesus is the door to be a part of the family of God. Jesus is the door to be a part of the church. Jesus is the door. And because he is the door, he keeps us secure. Right? So when you give your life to Jesus and you receive salvation, you enter in. But listen here. You don't enter back out. You are secure. No one can put you out of the church, even though they put you out of a local assembly. They can't put you out of the church of Jesus Christ. Like a blind man, seeing man now, they kicked him out of the synagogue. Can't nobody put you out of Jesus. I don't care if they like what you have on or not. They can't put you out of Jesus. If they don't like what you're reading or not, they can't put you out of Jesus. They don't like what you said. They can't put you out of Jesus. How do you enter the door? By believing in Jesus and who he says he is. By believing what he has done for you and for humanity. Shedding his blood. Dying on the cross. Coming back to life three days later. And this is so important, right? This is so important that Jesus tells us five times in that text that we just read, five times how he is going to give his life for us. Listen to what he says in verse 11. He says, I 
the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18, he says, no one take it from me, but I lay it down myself. And then number five, verse 18, he says, I have power. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Jesus wants you and I to understand that he died for you. And he came back to life three days later. And listen, Jesus is not a martyr for the cause, right? Nobody came and killed him. He gave his life. Voluntarily laid his life down. He voluntarily Gave himself to be nailed to a cross, voluntarily being able to be beat by people. Voluntarily went into that tomb. And he voluntarily got back up. They couldn't keep him down. Can I tell you, people can't keep you down. If you're a follower of Jesus, they may try to put you down. But if you're a follower of Jesus, he'll help you get lifted right back up. Coming back up, yeah. Coming back up. I don't know if that's a song. I kind of felt that. You know what I'm saying? Just kind of felt that. Kind of felt that. Probably ain't a song. Probably ain't a song. But I felt that. All right? So he has enough power to lay his life down. But he also has enough power to bring himself back up from the grave. And once we enter that door... And we become part of the body of Christ. He continues to lead us. So once you get saved, life is not over, right? Because if you got saved and you became perfect and life was just, was just glorious, you might as well just die and go to heaven, right? But that doesn't happen, right? You give your life to Christ and you keep on living. And when you keep on living, now it's time for him to sanctify you, to change you, to help you become more like Jesus, he led us to himself. And then once we got to him, he says, no, 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 no. The party ain't over. It's just starting. So I need you to follow me now. I need for you to, to follow me as I lead you. Because as the scripture says, he's trying to lead us to pastures. And when, and when the shepherd took the sheep to pastures, he was taking them places to graze. So they can eat and they can be full. To where he can feed us on his word. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be feeding the word of God. So that you can grow up and be satisfied in him. You can't be satisfied in anything else. You're going to search and search and search and everything going to come up empty. It is not until you find satisfaction in him, then everything else begins to make sense. To where we can drink from his holy presence and he quenches our thirst for righteousness. To where he leads us to safe places in life because we as sheep are prone to be drawn to trouble. We look for sin. I know you're saved. I know. I know. Been saved a long time. But sometimes you, you, you and I, we look for sin. We look to get into stuff. And because he is the good shepherd, he says, no, 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 you come back. Because you're going to get yourself in trouble. And he cares for us because we are prone to wander. To seek truth in other things. Right? It's so amazing to me, right? Christians, they say, yeah, I love y'all. I really do, right? Christians, right? They, they read the Bible for a little bit and then someone comes and tells them about this new book or this ancient book and you begin to read that and then you get all these questions and you ain't even read your own Bible all the way through. It's amazing to me. Right? I mean, how you go and study all this other stuff, get to learn all this other stuff, some witchcraft, some mysticism, right? Some ancient stuff and next thing you know you don't put the Bible down and you now you're studying all this. We're prone to wander. Jesus said, no, no, come back. Read... Uh, Read this, this, this one book that contain, contains 66 books. All the stuff you need is right there in this one book. When we will, willingly follow Jesus, after we're saved, 
He leads us, as the Bible says, into green pastures. So that we can have this, uh, as the scripture says, this life. Right? How, the Bible says how Jesus came to give us life. And not just, not just life, but abundant life. Right? This is this life that is, that is overflowing. This life that is uh, extravagant. Now understand, now this life is not talking about, you know, cars, money, you know what I'm saying, new shoes, gaiters, you know what I'm saying, younger people, Toms, right, all that kind of stuff, Jordans, not talking about that, right? The God will bless you so you can get you some of that, but he's not talking about that. He's talking about this, this, this life that's, that's, that's abundant. Life represents a relationship with God. This life represents communion and fellowship with God. He says, I want to give you communion with God. I want to give you fellowship with God. And not just any type of fellowship, this overflowing fellowship. This, 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 this relationship to where it is amazing. So that everyone understand, everyone who doesn't know Jesus, you don't believe in his death, burial, resurrection, the Bible says you are dead to God. You have no life. I know you're breathing and you're listening and you're seeing, but you have no life, the Bible says. You don't have any life because you're not connected to the source of life. And therefore, you are dead to God, but Jesus says, I don't want you to be dead. I want you to have life. Believe in me. And not only that, I want to give you this abundant life. To where when you believe in me, you're going to have an amazing relationship with God. A, a relationship that's personal, right? That you don't, have to, you don't have to always call Pastor Steve for a question. Guess what? You can read the Bible yourself. You can pray yourself. I'm not saying don't call me, you know, call me, whatever. But I'm saying you can talk to God for yourself. You can pray yourself. You don't have to go to a priest. Listen here, they got problems too. Right? You don't, you don't have to go to somebody to be an intercessor for you. Jesus is the mediator. Jesus is the intercessor. I'm here to teach you how to be more like Jesus. Listen, Jesus doesn't just want us to stop at the door. Right? He don't just want us to stop at salvation. He wants you to go deeper. A deeper relationship with him. A, a deeper intimacy with him. A deeper understanding of him. A deeper knowledge of him. A relationship that's so abundant, so overflowing, that, that you begin to know Jesus as Jesus knows the Father. That's amazing. Because Jesus and the Father, they're one. They know each other. Listen to what Jesus says in verses 14 and 15 of our text. He says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father. Jesus says, listen, just like me and, me and the Father know each other, I want to make sure that you and Jesus know each other. To where y'all are syncing up when it comes to thoughts. That, that you're syncing up when it comes to your words. That it's syncing up when it comes to your behavior. To where when people see you, they hear the words of Jesus and not the words of you. When, when people see you, they see the life of Jesus and not your life. To where you begin to live like Jesus, talk like Jesus, think like Jesus, be a little Jesus. Because you, listen here, you are the Jesus some people are going to see. You are the only Bible some people read. So you need to be able to think like him and act like him to where kind of like you know when you pray your prayers get answered why because you are praying in the will of God but when you pray you can see things change you can't do that if you're not linked up with them so when you pray you can actually begin to see blind folks get some sight you can pray for folks and though they are paralyzed, they can get up. I still believe in healing. The book ain't say it's finished. Book never said that once Jesus came or his death and resurrection, that no more miracles will happen. No, 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 no. Jesus has the same power yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the problem when it comes to healing is not the power of Jesus. It's me. It's my faith. 
It's your faith, but he can still heal folks today. Hallelujah. And Jesus wants to lead us to this abundant life. He wants you to have an abundant life with him. But in order for you to get that abundant life, you got to believe in who he is. You got to believe he died for you. You got to believe that he shed his blood for you. You got to believe he came back to life three days later for you. So I encourage you, accept what Jesus and the Bible says about every single person here and across the globe, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. That we are sinners who deserve the wrath of God. And that Jesus is that Savior who took the wrath of God for us so that we wouldn't have to. That all of God's anger was poured out on his son so that he can give you the relationship that he has with his father. And confess Jesus as your Lord. Believe that he is the Lord of your life. Make him your leader. Make him your God. Make him your savior. The Bible says if you repent of your sin, you ask for forgiveness, Jesus will be your Lord. So if you want to give your life to the Lord, I just ask you to say a prayer with me. Let us bow. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Father, I believe you sent Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you came back to life three days later. Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior. Now, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray that as you are the good shepherd, that you draw people to Jesus, that you draw them to yourself, O oh God, and that we who are followers of Jesus, that we will continue to follow the shepherd's leading, continue to follow the shepherd as he got. I thank you right now for what you to do, and I give you glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.